again, report and relationships are done subconsciously. So you want the client in their head or the prospect in their head to be like, I don't know what it is about this person, but I like this person. Go. The One Percenter Podcast with Sam Bakhtiar, bringing you the one percent knowledge to help you reach your full potential. Learn what it takes to rise above the 99% and become a one percenter. Welcome to the One Percenter Podcast. It's your boy Sam Bakhtiar with another good one for the second time now. You know, I don't bring too many people for the second time, but I got my man sales expert, business expert, and just a business, just an expert in acquiring customers. My man, Daniel G is in the house. He's in a lockdown in Toronto, but he's here with us right now on Zoom. He's gonna break down for us the sales process, how to overcome objections, how to acquire new customers, and how to just expand and grow your business and your personal brand. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate you having me back on. Thank you. I'm excited for this. I'm, I'm excited for round two. Thank you. So last time you came in and you spit some serious knowledge on the sales process, you know? So mm -hmm. since then, since then, what have you done differently? What are you doing differently through, towards the pandemic? Because I mean, the, the sales is sales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but as we grow every year, I modify my training routine. I modify, you know, the, the way I do things. What has been done how, what have you expanded on how have you changed some of your processes i mean i i think for for anybody that's in the game right now i always say like certain times will expose or promote individuals right so like when times get rough it's going to expose the true players in sales the true business owners it, 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 the true entrepreneurs right so to me i think um, through this pandemic, it's really exposed the individuals that were willing to pivot, shift and adapt to implement new strategies into their sales process, like using Zooms. Like now, to be honest with you, in the beginning, I was looking at it like cup half empty because I'm like, shit, now I can't be on the road and go on tours and speak on stages and have client meetings. And then the first week into pandemic, I'm like, well, heck, let me start training teams through Zooms. And I got done like Sam, like fucking... 300 calls in the in, in the last six months on zooms training teams which i would never be able to do on the road because i was using modern day technology and i was contacting a lot more people and i was getting it like you can get like to me I, I i love it because i just posted this on my instagram i'm like if you're not using your phone to make money right now like if you're not using your cell phone social media zoom calls to make money right now 10 years down the road your kids are going to look at you when you have kids or when i have kids you already have kids they're going to slap you in the face and they're going to be like, dad, why or mom, why the heck weren't you using your phone to make some money? So now it's never it, like that's it, it's stupid in a sense not to use it. It's kind of like when like when I my dad regrets in investing into Facebook or Google 20 years, it's too late. So to me, I think we're just the early adopters in realizing that you can get. 50 messages through the DM sent in the morning to prospect individuals and have five of them reply to you by lunch when in person to knock on doors, that would take you the whole day. And I can get that done while I'm brushing my teeth or eating breakfast. And to go a step further, an Instagram DM message, cool, but that's not as personal. But when you start really getting personal in sales, like pop open your Instagram DM, throw it on a 15 second video and be like, Hey, Sam, I was just thinking about you. I know you run a, a nutrition company. I know you're super, super busy, but I just wanted to see if I can add some sort and boom, jump in, add some value, start some new relationships. Like it's never been easier, Sam, to, to, to develop relationships right now. Wow. Wow. I mean, I mean, so you're, I, I guarantee you, I can, I can almost guarantee, guarantee that you have expanded your business. Ever since 150%. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yes. Um, I mean, we, I've never been so busy in terms of, of sales training. I said, if, if this is the moment to go all in, it's going to be right now in the last, uh, six to 12 months. Cause I have the most reach and I do realize a lot of individuals are at home. They're, they're at their laptops or at their computers. So my team, um, even though sales training is like, honestly, like 10 to 20% of my business. Cause I run a sales agency. So I outsource closers to other coaches consultants online that's the majority of my business people just think i'm a sales trainer but i i told a lot of my sales agents that are working for third-party coaches online 
guys, let's hit up a lot of teams and organizations for me to train them right now because their teams and organizations are at home and they got to find different ways and different technologies to implement into their new sales process. So yeah, business has definitely uh, doubled down. So Daniel, one of the biggest problems we, we always face in the gym business, which I own a bunch of gyms, is objections, overcoming uh -huh. objections. You know, how do you overcome objections in the sales process? I mean, how, how do you deal with it? Yeah, I mean, so if you look at an objection, it's, it's I, I just went over this with my, with my, because I know everybody has a different formula, but prior to the formula, like, think what an objection means. It, it either means this, they either have a limiting capability in themselves that they don't feel like the product would work for them or right. They don't feel like they could use it. So it's a limiting capability in the product or a limiting capability in themselves. When you really think of objections, like I don't think like I can get that person's results or I don't think that's going to get me the results that I want. Everything else are typically things that they, like nobody's ever going to tell you that objection. First of all, nobody's ever like, you'll get the three main objections, time, money, and skill. Those are always the three main objections, time, money, and skill. You'll hear them in different formats, but you'll always have three different objections. I don't have time. Give me a few weeks to think about it. I don't have the budgets. I don't have the funds. I don't have the money right now. Let me think about it. A time objection. Let me speak to my spouse. Another time objection, just trying to delay it. But in reality, when you think of the skill set objection, it's actually super important, which I think people just pass over. The skill set objection is typically the one that's never said to the, to the, to the salesperson because we don't want to be like, well, I don't think I could do this or, or I don't have the confidence enough to use a product or I don't think I'll get the results. So let me just tell them I don't have the time. Let me just tell them I don't have the money. But in reality, the ability of a sales rep is to ask the right questions and make sure that the user and the prospect on the other hand in their head sees the service, the simplicity and the system. So they feel like they can use it because that's typically the objection in their head. They're like, if everybody felt like they would get your best clients results, everybody would do it. Like if, if every prospect felt like they would get your best testimonials results, everybody would do it, but nobody feels like they can get that ROI or that nice body. Cause they don't feel either like they could do it or that they'll put in the work or that you'll give them the right service or support. So typically I, I say, guys, you got to find out two things. Did you sell enough that they seen enough value that it's not your product and it's typically an internal capability that they can't solve or right. It's not an internal capability and value has not overcome price. Meaning this anytime the value of your product offer or service has outweighed the cost of them buying that's when a buyer will make a purchasing decision. So if the value is more than investment, buyer makes a purchasing decision. Actually better yet perceived value because every individual has a different perception of value. Meaning this coffee may have more of a perceived value than uh, it does to Sam. So the, the $5 that I pay for this, maybe Sam will pay for it because that's perceived value. So when perceived value outweighs the cost of the coffee, that's when a buyer makes a decision. Does that make sense? Yeah, that totally makes sense. Now. You know, a lot of times, you know, when I was, you know, when I was on the trenches and when I was selling people, you know, um, you know, we use a method called commitment and consistency. I'm sure you're familiar with that. You know, you get somebody to say, yes, yes, yes. Sure. When, when, when you ask for the price, you know, when, when you present them the, the solution, it's almost like they can't go no because they feel like they're a liar because they just said yes, yes, yes. Right. Does, that, does that still work? Is that something that you, 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 um, because, because I mean, I, mean I, know, I know that's something that, we use back in the day and I'm outdated, yeah, yeah. Daniel. I'm not, I'm not as sharp as you, you know, you're, you're in the trenches every single day. Oh, like encyclopedia type, type of sale. When they used to sell encyclopedias <laughs> door to door, they used to have them go through the yes, 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 yes. Like, do you want your kids to be more educated? Yes. Do you want to make more money? Yes. And then by the, towards the end of the sale, you expect the customer to say, yes. The only thing here, the puncher is that I just think clients are a lot more educated and smarter than ever that that won't, that trap, they probably, they're not going to fall into. And I don't think a buyer is sold it. I think where a buyer is sold when they truly have commitment to product where they really see themselves using it, where they really see it um, solving a challenge from the self, because then the, I think there's just so much access to information that the buyer, the salesperson really has to come in and solve a time or a money issue in order for a buyer to say yes. It's not just a sequence of yeses. Cause I know some people now not to go commitment early on in the sale is super important. Meaning like commitment to them, uh, 
to an agenda of you just being like, Hey, I want to lay out the agenda. Do you just mind if I lay out the agenda? Yes. Awesome. So this is what I'm going to do really quickly. I'm going to ask you a few quick questions. I just want to see if you're going to be the right fit. Is that cool? Yes. Awesome. If I feel like you're the right fit, I'll definitely show you what we have to offer. I'll show you our water bottles. If not, I'll definitely point you in the right direction. Is that cool? Yes. Awesome. Hey, by the way, towards the end of the conversation, if you don't feel like this is going to be the right fit for you, do you mind doing me a favor? Yes. Awesome. Just tell me if there's going to be a yes or no answer. Don't tell me I want to think about it. Can you do that for me? Yes. Awesome. Okay. By the way, where are you from? Boom. I got some upfront commitments. I got that yes engagement from the client, but that's not going to get me sold. That's just me taking control of the conversation. It's kind of like when you go buy a car and a good car salesman is going to say, Hey, he's going to pull out the chair and he's going to be like, Hey, sit down right here. And he's just trying to get you into his controls. So as a salesperson over the phone, I'm saying, Hey, by the way, I'm going to set the tone, just like a good CEO or a good founder does in the beginning of the meeting, guys, this is what we're going over. And I want you to commit to them that way. When there's an objection, I'm the man or I'm the woman in charge. Right. And, and the prospect isn't the person in charge. That's amazing. And you know what, like you said, that the, the consumer now is so much more educated than a consumer 10, 15 years ago. You know, so the sort of old tricks are not going to work anymore. You know, you, you need to actually solve a problem. You need to actually, you know, a system in a, in a, in a different way. And yes. that's, why, you know, that's why you're so cutting edge and all the stuff that you teach. You, it's not like a normal, you know, Zig Ziglar book, you know, which is, which is cool to read and all that kind of stuff. Huh. But, you know, you know, but, but, but this is a whole new, whole new era. This is a whole new era. It need, needs a whole new different approach. A hundred percent. And, and all those books are great. Cause you and I have read them all. Brian Tracy Zings of their Tom Hopkins, the GCs, all those guys, we've read all their books and they're great fundamentals. Cause the sales process never changes. I just think the buyer has changed and the time and, and when it comes time to listen before in the, the eighties, the nineties, 2000, early 2000s, you were the anchor as a salesperson, meaning you were the one to first educate the sale, to, to educate the prospect. Now the prospect is more like more educated than ever prior to them getting on a phone call. So now when they're on a phone call, right, you're trying to educate them on top of what they already know before you were the anchor, meaning you were the first person educating them. They didn't know anything else about other encyclopedias. Now they price shop. Now they know your product offer service. Now you got to come in as a strategical salesperson and figure out how it's going to help that type of individual buyer solve their time, money, skill uh, problems, right? So you're just coming in at a bit later in the sales process and got to do a little bit more educating because they're going to be not such a fast paced buyer. They're going to be a slow paced buyer. And it's super important to realize that. And some people are going to be fast paced buyers. Like to me, I'm a fast paced buyer. I know what I want to get on a phone call. I buy it. Maybe that's because we're salespeople, but yes. Yeah. Now, as far as acquiring customers, yeah. So you say I'm in a business, you know, I, you know, whether I'm an online business or I'm a brick and mortar business, how can someone acquire more customers? Because everybody wants more customers. Of course, acquisition. So if you look at the top of an acquisition, like acquisition, closing a client, that's commit, that's a commit. So look at it. So that's getting somebody to commit it to your product. Let's just say that's at the fifth step on the process. So that's commitment. That's yes. Acquisition. Yes. Underneath that, would be you have to solve a challenge or a problem, which is four. And typically, like I said, let's say step number four is solving a problem. You can't, you can't close if you don't solve a problem. And typically in the branches of that, that's time, money, skill. And then after solving that problem, well, you can't solve a problem if you don't ask the right questions, which is step number three. You can't ask the right, or the buyer will not answer those questions truthfully if you don't build trust, step number two. Wow. wow. And if you don't, you can't build trust, step number one, if you don't have a relationship and rapport with them. Very simple. Like if all those things aren't in line, well, you could do anything. Cause I hear sales experts and this is what you should do to close a deal. Well, dude, you can't close a fucking deal on step number five. If you've done step number one and two wrong, you could try to say, I could give you every single closing line that you want, but if the person doesn't trust you, they're not going to buy from you. So good. So good. Right. So to me, here's what I think it is now when you're going from the trust game, so now you're like, Daniel, how do people acquire clients? I'm going to start at the relationship and report game prior to them even getting on phone call with one of your sales reps. If you own a company or, or you, maybe you're the, the, the solar salespreneur of your business prior to them getting on a phone call, the trust is built online. So I'm not going to trust Sam like, or have a relationship with him, whether I met him or not subconsciously, unless I've seen him eight to 15 times online. So like you could start that, that relationship and report prior to you even getting on a phone call with them, because I, I don't buy shit my first time around. I'm like, okay, let me just see if this person's going to actually just stick around 
for another month. Let me just see how, let, okay, let me see their client testimonials in the next month to two months. So exposure is number one. How many times, like how many times is your prospect, your ideal client profile, your ideal uh, prospect, how many times are they being exposed to your product offer service or opportunity? Like, okay, if it's two times, well, it's going to be a more difficult sale. So maybe that comes from running ads. Maybe that comes from going heavier on social media. Maybe that goes to, to, to running your campaign. Cause I can tell you what, when my clients come through my funnel and they want sales training or they want somebody else, they're already so warmed up to me that they have so much trust in me that it makes my sales guys jobs a lot easier just to qualify them. So it, again, going back to using this as a tool and then, um, and, and then playing out. And another thing is knowing your numbers inside of your business for client acquisition. A lot of business owners do not know their numbers. And, and this is super important. Meaning like how many people do you got to reach out to per day to just get a certain amount interested. And then out of those certain amount that are interested, how many of those interested become buyers? So many, let's say I'm selling a new coffee brand. Well, I got to reach out to a hundred individuals on social media. 77 will probably ignore me. Uh, 13 will probably tell me to F off and give me objection. And 10 out of those hundred will just be like, okay, I want to see more. So now I know I have a 10% interest level. And I always play the rule of, of 10%. I'm like 10 out of the 10% out of the ones that are interested, probably one will buy. So when you know your numbers, let's just say, if you know your numbers from cold market outreach, if you know your numbers, that's important. So you don't give up at 87 because you know there's another 13 down the road. Now, number one, know your numbers. I'm going to screw some people up here listening to this. It's also the law of averages, meaning that if, if your stats is, let's say, okay, for every 100 people I hit up, 10 reply. For every 10 people that reply, one person closes. Now, you know, for every 100, one person closes. Yeah. And you're like, but Daniel, I did 113 and nobody closes. Yes, because it's a law of averages. So you got to know the law of averages. What you fail to realize is that maybe it took 300 people that you had to hit up and on 298, 299 and 300, all your, your 10% rule lies right there. Your batch comes in right there because sales is batches. And then the 10% rule becomes true at 298, 299 and 300. But what you did is you quit at 297 and your three sales were right around the corner. It's the law of averages. It's like, you can win in the casino on day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. Stay long enough, you're going to lose because the casino will win. They're not built on losers. The law of averages, stay long enough, casino owners will win. Casinos will win. So good. Can you now, real quick, you know, you broke down, you know, the whole sales process. You know, you know, you know, relationship, trust, you know, you know, all that. I think, I believe you broke down to like five things. Can you briefly go over each one because that's so good, man. I mean, that's so good. I mean, I think that everybody needs to know those little processes and how they can move it to the next process. Like you said, you can't you can close on step five if you haven't done one or two right. So how can we do each process right? Start at the bottom. So uh, relationship and rapport, call it the Rolls Royce. This is like the dawn of the sales process because like, if you don't do this, again, if I don't have relationship and rapport, they will not trust me, which actually relationship and rapport and trust all go within each other. Right. But it's a stage number two, which they're like, yes, I trust this guy. That's stage number two. So if I don't have this done relationship and rapport, when I go into questioning, right. And ask them a question, they'll probably lie to me on that question. Cause they don't feel like they, it's like, it's like on a date. If you, if the person trust you if the girl on the other end of the day trusts you on the first date she's going to talk about everything that was bad about her ex-boyfriend bad about whatever her ex relationship and she's going to say this oh my god it felt like i knew you for years i've been talking for so long what is that you do because she trusted you you built relationship and rapport with that individual so in the beginning stages of a conversation relationship and report is typically done number one by scrapping the sale in the in the salesperson's head meaning too many salespeople go into the sales like, I need to sell this person somebody. When in reality, you should go into the business of being like, okay, you know what? If I'm really in business for the next 10 to 20 years, I'm in the business of collecting friends. So in the beginning stages of this, because maybe it's no sale now, but maybe two years down the road, plant seed, it's sale two years down the road. So in the beginning stages, if Daniel said it's relationship and rapport, the double R's, the Rolls Royce, the moment I get onto a conversation with the individual, I'll stop right away and say, hey, by the way, prior to anything that we're about to talk about today, 
man, give me the rundown, man. What's up with you? Have you been healthy? How's COVID in your city? Give me the rundown. I want to kind of better understand like who you are, what you're doing right now. And right there, when you can open up and allow them to talk about themselves, the way relationship and report is built is the moment in a conversation, because all you're trying to do in, in relationship and report is you're trying to see what their interest level is or what they're interested in and park there. So, and you'll typically know when a client's interested, when they start talking a lot about something or, or, or like in person, their eyes will sparkle up or they have a smile. That's where you park. Even if you're not interested, right? I always say like, nobody will give a shit until you give a shit, right? We've all heard this. Nobody cares until you care enough, right? So, so the moment they start talking a lot, that's when you park for the first two to five minutes of the phone call and be like, tell me more. So what do you mean by like, you were running a makeup business? Like, that's interesting. Do you sell the makeup online? Do you do it offline? Like, I'm, ge I'm genuinely curious. Like, how does that work? I'm not in that industry. How did you get into that? That is, that is making the client feel good about themselves because everybody likes talking about themselves. So report is done subconsciously. So Again, report and relationships are done subconsciously. So you want the client in their head or the prospect in their head to be like, I don't know what it is about this person, but I like this person. And the reason why they're saying that in their head is because they're like, wow, this person got me to talk. And I like any individual that I can talk to. A woman is attracted to a guy when that guy has two ears and no mouth and she could just talk to that individual. That is one of the most attractive traits. So tie it back into sales. Cause I always sometimes go into dating to make that, to, to, to bridge that gap, tie it back into sales, take interest into what they're interested in. And if you're ever, if you're ever lost in how to have a conversation in the beginning stages, there's a breakdown. Like you have location, occupation, family. I'm always like L O F. Like, look, like, so it's not like, Hey, where are you from? What do you do for a living? How many kids you have? They're going to be like, Holy shit. Do you want to steal my kids? Like it's a framework to use when, when, you don't know where to start in the conversations. By the way, where are you from? Location. And if, if they're, if, cause location can only go so far. Nice, nice. So you're down in California. How's the weather there? That can only go so far. So move into occupation. If they spark, if they like what they're doing or, or they're, uh, or they have a bunch of hobby park on that and ask them more questions about that. Now um, for the viewers that are not watching this and are listening to build rapport and have a good conversation, there's two types of communication. There's wide communication and there's deep communication. Wide communication essentially means this. You ask a question, totally irrelevant to the last question that you asked. So I'm, I'm going wide right now with my finger. So it's like, so what do you do for a living? Oh, you know, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a fitness trainer. Awesome, nice. Do you have kids? The next question was totally unrelated to the last question, which is wide communication. It starts to feel like an interview process. Nobody likes that. I go deep. I go deep. Gotta go deep. It's they. You ask a question, they answer. Ask a question based off their answer. Nice. That's have good flowing conversation. Then when you build up that relationship, trust, and rapport, you move into stage three, which is the question phase, right? Which you ask questions um, because if you don't ask the right questions, you can't solve the right problems. And you said to park on every single one. So when you're in stage three the first thing you should be asking is, hey, by the way, I know we scheduled a 15 minute call. I know we're sitting down right now. Um, what made you take out 15 minutes of your day to even, you know, to, to look at our products? Like what, what's up? Like, what, I want to know what, what, why did you dedicate 15 minutes of your day? Cause some people don't even watch my stories for 15 seconds. So obviously there's something that, you know, strikes something for you where you're interested. What, what, well, cause typically when you ask that one question, why did you spend the time? They will typically go into their problems themselves. Well, honestly, like, um, you know, business has been super difficult and, uh, I lost my job during COVID. I'm trying to find a second source of income. They'll go into their challenge themselves. So sometimes it could just be, Hey, why'd you, why'd you take the time to like, sit down? Like, like, why did you want to invest 15 minutes to have a conversation today? Tell me like, what's up? It's, okay. it's that. And then you could say, okay, now so let's park on questions for a second. What you're trying to do as a sales individual is you're trying to bridge a gap in sales. So what you're essentially trying to do is this. Hey, where are you at right now within your life, your business? What's your current situation, right? So where are you at? What are you doing right now? Oh, I'm doing da, 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 X, Y, Z. Perfect. Where do you want to get to? How much do you want to be making per month? What do you want to do and how much do you want to be making per month? Uh, you know, I'd like to start an online business. I'd like to be making anywhere between, you know, three to $5,000 a month. Okay, so you're currently sitting at 1,000 and you want to make uh, $5,000 a month. The gap is four. So it's like, I'm in Brooklyn. I need to get to New York city, right? 
that that's the two that's a this is my current destination this is future future destination but here's the deal i can't swim to brooklyn right now because it's super cold so you need a you need a bridge to bridge it so it's like hey by the way so the bridge is you as a sales individual the first question i'm going to ask is why haven't you already made that extra four thousand dollars and the reason why I'm going to ask that question is because it's typically going to allow the prospect to realize that they don't have the necessary tools, resources, and, and systems in place to get that $4,000. So I'm going to say, okay, well, they're going to typically go back to me and say, well, that's a good question. I, I never, I, I guess I don't have the right mentorship. I don't have, I guess I don't have the right support. I guess I don't have the right people around me. I didn't know that I can make an extra $4,000 online a month. So now they know where they're at. And this is being a good salesperson, a salesperson, when, when you can't see a sales individual uh, in, in person, what you're doing as a salesperson is you're drawing out the, the scenario in their head with your words It's being a good artist. So what I'm doing right now is I'm drawing out kind of like a painting in their head saying, this is where I am. This is where I want to be. I will not get there without that guy now. Now I could see that because I'm using me, Daniel, I'm using the right words to draw, map out the client's situation. And then I'm going to come in and bridge the gap and saying, Hey, listen, if I could show you a way where we could potentially get you from a thousand to $5,000, would you be open and willing to see what I have to offer or to see what we do with our clients and make them that extra $4,000? Yes. Awesome. And then that's commitment to present. And then I go on to present the solution. Um, so that would be, that would be, you know, uh, finding out their challenges, the problems and struggles. You'll typically find out their challenges right there by asking that challenging question saying, Hey, why didn't you make that extra $4,000? Then you jump into a presentation mode. And when you present your offer, um, I think it's very simple. You don't have to talk about your offer for 15, 20 minutes. I think people got to really break down the details of their offer and how it's delivered. So by the way, this is why people buy our product one, two, three. And as a salesperson, you should be able to say your offer in under 60 seconds, in two minutes, 20 minutes, or an hour. That's the ability of a good salesperson. Just as coaches and consultants, when we get on stage and somebody says you have a 20 minute keynote, it's like, okay, I got two minutes to say my story and not 20 minutes to say my story. Now I see a lot of people, you know, they, you know, they do a presentation and when it comes to offer, they just linger it on, linger it on, linger it on. And, you know, there's something, you know, we used to say in sales that it says, you know, you can talk yourself right out of the sale. You know, is that, is that true? A hundred percent. The deal, like you could, you could, the client can already be sold and you just need to show them one thing that's going to heal their problem, but you just kept overselling and now you shot yourself in the foot. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that over and over again. I'm like, oh my God, he talks so much. He actually lost the sale. Yeah. It's, it's sold like Sam, man, I got a sales floor out there. Sometimes I'll yell between three doors. I'll be like, stop, stop talking. They're done. Like, just let them talk, <laughs> like, let them talk. And, and that is such a good point you brought up because you should be closing throughout the whole sale and, and test trial closing throughout the whole sale and be like, Hey, by the way, out of everything that I just showed you in the last 60 seconds, what option would you take one, two or three? I'd probably do three. All right, perfect. Let's do it. Oh no. Well, not yet. Okay. Let me keep selling. Test trial close. And Danny, I know you do a lot of sales and you're really good at it, you know, and I know a good salesperson can not only sell. I can also sell in a way that, you know, somebody will not have a buyer's remorse later. Mm. So, you know, so I see a lot of people that are really good at sales, but they also get a lot of refunds and, you know, uh, a lot of things come back. Now, what would you do, you know, to minimize buyer's remorse and minimize, you know, somebody be like, oh, you know, I bought, but I really shouldn't have bought or, or whatnot. Great question, Sam. Early on intimacy, meaning the moment somebody buys a program, a product offer or service, the intimacy right after, because let's put it this way. Daniel will show you that our systems are great. We have great support and service. Uh, it, it's very simple to use, right? Um, and these are things the buyer want to hear. Like, okay, can I use it? Simplicity. I always say three S's. Simplicity, support and service, great systems. But the moment they buy, what the buyer is looking for is that right away. So it's like right after the sales process, who hit them up right away to be like, hey, you're in community right now community is what connects people. Hey, you're part of our group chats right now. Hey, by the way, Kaylee's going to call you within the next four hours and she's going to get you onboarded right away to make them feel now they're part of family. Because what happens is this, right? In a sales pro process, you got a lot of chemicals going on through the brain. You got like dopamine firing off, right? You got oxytocin 
firing off. You got endorphins firing off, like all these exciting emotions, like, oh my God, this is going to be amazing. I'm going to change my weight. I'm going to change my body. I'm going to change my health. Like you got all these things firing off. And you sell off of that in sales. So if you look at it, I always say D-O-S-E, like a sales dose, D-O-S-E, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, uh, endorphins, right? Feel good emotions. Now the S was serotonin. Well, this is how you keep a client, okay? This is the retention of a client. Serotonin is a connection chemical. It makes you feel part of something bigger than yourself. So it's super important that you inflicted dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin in the sale, those feel good emotions that after the sale, the serotonin is there and you're like, hey, now you're part of a family. I want to let you know that now you're part of the X tribe. Now you're part of the Sam tribe and you make them feel like they're a part of everybody wants to be a, a part of something bigger than themselves. Like they like having a label. They like being part of a team. So to me, it's early on intimacy and early on contact because the salesperson can say a whole bunch of shit, but if they're not delivering that right away, You've lost trust and sales and marketing. Great question. Go hand in hand from the beginning to the end of a sales process. And it's not who you could sign up. It's who you could keep. Love it. So, so we got, you know, we, we got the marketing, we got the sales, you know, you know, we, you know, we have the early on retention by, by, you know, bring them into the culture, you know, you know, make, you know, you know, early touch points, you know, and so now how can we get them to stay and refer? How can we get them to stay and refer? Yeah. So staying and referral is two different things. A, a referral is, to me, I, I think people wait, wait too long for referrals. I'm going to be honest. I think people wait too long because if people really understand human beings, the moment they make a decision, they want to defend their decision. So, so watch this. If I go buy, I don't know, a new fucking a Bentley tomorrow or a new Rolls Royce tomorrow, I want to go to all of my rich friends in the States and be like, you know why this, like, you guys need a Rolls Royce. You want to know what's up about this thing? Or you need this new, you need this. You want to defend it right away. Oh, so geez. to me, I've tried to get referrals right away because there's, there's never a right and there's never a wrong time. But now, excited, right? Because they're excited about their purchase. Too. They're excited. And why not join with somebody on board that's going to be your accountability partner? So the moment they bought, hey, by the way, I know you just onboarded. Who are two to three people that you would think would be remotely interested, right? Because we have a kickback program. Who are two to three people that would be remotely interested? Maybe that way you don't even have to pay for your subscription because it's two and free. And companies got to start learning this. Like, Companies got to start a referral process ASAP. And I can guarantee you when I tell business owners, they're like, what do you mean three and free or four and done or whatever? I'm like, well, you got to have an incentive for a customer to refer quickly. So what's the incentive right off the bat for them to refer? Because they're at a high point right now. And yeah, if somebody tells me I don't have to pay for my subscription of shakes, if I just get three people right away, that's a high incentive for me to do it right now. And my subscription of shakes is free for the first three months or whatever the case is. Now I'm, I'm, I'm compelled because I want to defend and I don't want to pay for, for the shakes and I'm going to get a kickback on it. And I'm going to be uh, getting some sort of acknowledgement and recognition, which is super important as a business owner to incorporate both of those things, acknowledgement and rec uh, uh, recognition within your new customers, a VIP client, whatever the case is. So that's one. Another time you should be ref uh, asking for referrals is after they've done anything well inside of the company. So at any time they have any sort of win, there should be somebody dedicated right there and then to get a testimony and get a referral. Because they don't hate you in that moment. They're most excited about you in that moment. Yeah, love it. And love after it. any great calls that you have with your clients, uh, if you're running Zoom calls, it doesn't even have to be a, a, a materialistic win of money or, or like it doesn't have to be a five even a great call and they're like dan and they're hitting me up through the dm bro that was amazing hey by the way do you have five seconds yeah hey bro zoom call me really quickly dude do you mind making me a 60 second video i'm just going to interview you tell me three things that you liked about that call and why you like working with me it could be their second week yeah for sure 100 yes. then business owner if they're smart takes that current client if you're just starting up a business we talked about marketing right Take that client interview for 60 seconds, plop it back on your social media, click run ad and promote it because people will trust your clients more than they trust you. And, and that's power of social proof. Now you brought, you, 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 you brought that up. So how important, I mean, obviously it's important, you know, because I've interviewed, you know, I've, I've interviewed and I know personal trainers in the industry, badass personal trainers. I mean, these guys are just crushing it, right? Crush it all, you know, crush it for years and years and years. I don't have one social proof. And now their business is struggling. And I'm going like, hey, dude, like, what did you do for the past 20 years? 
You know, you know, you didn't get any before and after pictures. I know you had a bunch of people in shape. So, so let's talk about social proof, how, how to automate it, how to, how to set up systems so that your business has a constant flow of social proof. Because as you know, like you just said, you know, they're going to trust other people's. I mean, of course, you're going to say you're the best. The other person is going to say the best. Everybody says, no, nobody says, hey, man, you know, I'm good. But you know what? Daniel was better than me. I want you to go pay him. Nobody's going to say that, right? So how can we get social proof on automation? A hundred percent. So first, before automation is the sweat equity part, because I don't even think, just like you said, Sam, not enough people are just doing it. Like after you train a client, that's another sale, but you're just thinking, okay, like how do I get my next client? But after that client is sweating, it's, hey, Sarah, go stand in front of that white wall. I'm going to have somebody videotape you while you're sweating, right? Put that in with these three questions. Somebody has three questions, standard three questions as to what you liked about the workout and why you like working with me and plopping that back onto your social media. I say this, people are, you know, it's very interesting because I, I, I think as content creators, we get in this flow, but some people look at us and they're like, well, what do I put on social media? There's so many opportunities for you to create content. It doesn't have to be about yourself. Again, your customers, your clients are your best salespeople for you. And, and before even the whole automation part, it's literally attacking all of them right now and saying, going up to all of them right now and getting them to send you a 15 to 30 second video, a 60 second video and putting it back on your social media. And yes, overwhelming your social media with social proof because enough, they're going to be like, okay, well, if he says it's good, he says it's good because one social proof will not sell somebody because every buyer is in a different situation. So every single, every single testimonial has a different story. And the story of the mother of three is different than the story of the kid that's going to college. So in my head, when I'm putting together, and this is super important as an entrepreneur, if you have a system or a product, when you're putting together your suite of testimonials, make sure that suite of testimonials encompasses different stories from different walks of life, because those different stories from different walks of life are going to sell a different points of your marketplace and different individuals. Does that make sense? Oh, oh, totally makes sense, man. You know, you know, for us, man, we can't just have you know, a, a girl in her thirties that's married and on a testimony all the time. You, you got to have mm. you know, somebody who's older, you know, somebody's in different shape, somebody who has a different occupation, different story, you know, res resonates with different people. Just fantastic stuff, Daniel. And another good point is this, is that you have to allow your, so when you talked about a system, there's questions involved in that system. The questions you should be asking your clients or to, to be answering, or you should be asking your clients is, like, hey, by the way, what were your thoughts prior to joining us? And why did you decide to join us? And what is your experience now? Because the old 1980s feel felt found method in sales should be done in a client testimonial where it's like, I did it. I was skeptical because I was a mother of three and I didn't think I had time. Little did I know Daniel put me on a, I'm a personal trainer on a personal training program that allowed me to work out for 25 minutes a day and get in the same workout that some people would do in an hour. And I was able to do that while balancing my life. So now you sold the mother of three on the other end that didn't have time. But if you don't ask that questions and tell your clients to say, Hey, why didn't, why were you skeptical in the beginning? Why did you decide to do it? And what is your experience right now? Three main, very easy questions. You can one, two, three. Hey, why did you decide? Why, why were you skeptical at first? Why didn't you pull the trigger right away? Because if I know that's difficult because some entrepreneurs don't want to ask that question. Cause that's, uh, I was a bit because of their marketing. No, say that because everybody else is thinking that let the, let the client tell the honest truth because they're like, well, yeah, I didn't really believe in it at first as well. Let them say that, let your client say that. And then when I said, you know what, enough is enough. If nothing changes, nothing changes. I decided to pull the trigger five months down the road. What I realized is da, 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 da. now you're bringing the person that's seen that client testimony saying like, oh shit, I'm thinking the exact same thing. Yeah, Maybe I should yeah, yeah. I love it, man. So much golden nuggets, bro. Thank you so much, man. I mean, every time you come in, man, like, like you know, you, you have figured out the sales process. You just figure out the whole business as a whole, how to not only market, sell, and you know, you know, acquire customers. Daniel, you know, thank you so much for the time being here, man. I know you're locked down, but I appreciate you being on here. Tell us and tell everyone watching this where we can find more, more about you, 
or where we can get your courses and, and inquire more about your services. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. First of all, thank you, Sam, for allowing me to come back on for round two. Um, definitely when I'm back in California, I'm going to swing by uh, the, the headquarters over there and we could kick it. But um, in terms of, you know, I have always my links in my bio, which is Daniel G. So it's very easy to find on Instagram. I have links in the bio. Um, so if you just go to Daniel G, I'm always, you know, doing events around and things like that. Sometimes I have sales training programs on or off right now. I don't really have programs. I'm focused on my agency. But if you ever want a training call, or you guys want me to train your organization, hit me up through social media or my emails in there and we could uh, run something from there. Thank you again, Sam, for having me. Hey guys, if you like today's episode, do me a huge favor. Go ahead and leave a comment below, subscribe to the channel, leave me a review, and tag a few friends that you think can benefit from what we share today. Really appreciate it. God bless.